Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I just got a question today in my YouTube comments about what my original career plans were and I realized that I make references quite a fair bit to my previous life but I haven't really told the full story of how I got into doing software engineering so I thought I would address that today. The goal with this is that if you're coming to software engineering from a non-traditional background that you can find some inspiration and even if you're not that you can maybe draw a few principles or ideas from my story and that it can ultimately help you in your own path. Okay, so the question I got was what my original career plans were. And so I will take it back to college, maybe a little bit before then. So I started to do pretty well in school around eighth grade uh, for my international audience. That's around 13 years old. And so when I got into high school, I kind of had the momentum on my side as far as school was concerned. I had been getting all A's in middle school and kind of carried that into high school. Not to brag, that's just kind of how it was. And um, I was really interested in doing Spanish and learning a foreign language. I had had an aunt and an uncle that both spoke Spanish fluently and had lived abroad in Spain. And so I was really, really set on learning Spanish. I was excited to learn. And I happened to have a really great teacher for my first two years in high school. Now, after my junior year in high school, we had AP Spanish, but it was going to be kind of self-study. It wasn't gonna be formally taught. And so I made the decision to go to the local college where I lived, which is called MTSU. And I took a basically 300, so junior level college class, both semesters when I was a senior in high school. And so needless to say, I was fired up for foreign language. I never had really felt naturally gifted in anything, but that was totally different when it came to Spanish. But I wasn't just interested in Spanish itself, I was kind of interested in language at large and studying language kind of as a human phenomenon. And so I really wanted to study linguistics. And so when I went to college, I had plans to be a linguistics professor. Now, the only problem with that was that I picked a college that didn't have a linguistics degree program. I picked my college based on a few different things, but one of those things was that uh, it was top ranked in the country for study abroad participation and essentially for making it easy for people to study abroad. And so I knew that that was going to be a really, really big priority for me in my language acquisition. And so I ended up kind of making my choice based on that. That was a huge factor for me when deciding where to go to college. So I was at college and I wanted to be a linguistics professor, but I wasn't quite sure how to get there given what my options were. So when I got to college, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know how to pursue linguistics given that we didn't have a degree program for it. And so I settled on a strategy of majoring in French and Spanish. Now, in retrospect, this wasn't a great idea for a few different reasons. One was that a few other disciplines would have paired really well with Spanish and helped me get closer to studying linguistics like philosophy, computer science, and math. I've since learned have a really large degree of overlap in some areas with linguistics, but I thought just studying straight languages probably was going to be the best way. I thought French was interesting, but the problem was that I was starting from zero in French and I was starting out way ahead or ahead of most people in Spanish. And so to make something that's a pretty long story sh more short, I ended up studying abroad, which was a requirement where I went to school. And so I had a good time, but a hard time. So my ultimate goal was to be fluent in Spanish. And I ultimately achieved that by my own definition at the end where I was basically, uh, people weren't able to tell me uh, apart from native speakers. And so I was able to pass myself off as a native speaker or at least not American. And so I felt like that was a win. Uh, something that happened after that, which I didn't anticipate was that my uh, passion kind of dried up. I was starting to get interested in a few other things and I just kind of didn't have as much motivation anymore because I felt like I'd done everything I ever wanted to do with Spanish. Also, I had kind of a hard time when I was studying abroad in terms of mental health. I was dealing with a lot of anxiety 
and the nature of the program I was in was pretty lonely. I was going through another college called Middlebury, which is one of the best in the country for studying foreign languages, but I didn't end up making many friends in my program and had some kind of difficult housing situation stuff, which I might talk about in the future. But needless to say, when I got back to the US, I was ready to stay put for a while. And that kind of precluded me from finishing my French major because at my college, we had to study abroad one semester for each foreign language. And I just wasn't feeling like going back overseas again. And so, like I said, I decided to do something different because my interests academically had changed. So I added a couple minors. I took classes kind of far and wide outside of my discipline, ended up learning a lot, ended up kind of really broadening my mind, I think, more than I ever had in college. And, you know, the whole point, like I said in my last video about liberal arts, is to kind of make you well-rounded. But I, in all of high school and up to this point in college, it kind of just stayed in my comfort zone and not really pushed myself. And so I was interested in maybe being a doctor. I took a biology class. I was interested in the kind of ethics and humanistic side of medicine. So I added a minor in medical humanities. I took all kinds of random classes. I took a class in the history of American foreign relations. It was a really, really interesting time those last three semesters of college, but my original plan was kind of bust. I applied for a few fellowships and things after college, but I really had no idea what I wanted to do. And so I ended up teaching for a year at a private high school in Atlanta. And so it was kind of a fellowship type of deal where I lived in a house with two other guys who became great friends. The purpose of this program was for us to see if we wanted to teach full time and get some experience doing it, working with a more experienced teacher and kind of taking over some of their classes. At the end of that year, I knew that I didn't want to be a high school teacher full time, which was totally fine. So I made my exit and moved back closer to where I went to school. My wife was starting her career and I knew that we were probably going to get married and so I wanted to be near her. So I made the decision to move back that way. At that point, I had this kind of romantic notion that I would just figure out the next step and that it would be kind of fun to just piece things together. But in practice, it ended up being pretty brutal. That kind of academic year, which was fall of 2015, uh, starting time was really, really tough. I ended up taking a job in foster care, which I thought would be noble. I was kind of concerned at that point, much, much more concerned, I would say, with having a job that explicitly was doing good in the world and tied to some kind of higher ideal, I guess you might put it that way. And what ended up happening was that the job paid $12 an hour for 25 hours a week. Looking back, I think what I would do now is just to try to make money online, like doing marketing or building websites or whatever. But of course, that comes much more naturally to me now than it did then. I think I just kind of took what was right in front of me and like I said, kind of tied to that higher ideal. But in practice, it was brutal. It was a really tough year. I was barely making rent. Uh, I took a lot of other little side jobs to try and kind of put things together. My wife loves to tell this story where I got let go from working at a donut shop. And so needless to say, it was just a really long and tough year. And during that time, I would get to work, turn on you know, the Casey Neistat vlog, which was like one of the only things I had to look forward to. And it was a big reason that I'm sitting in front of you today. But I would turn on the vlog, you know, go do my work, go back home and just kind of think about what am I going to do? And I was kind of in agony, like not really having a real plan, feeling like I was spinning my wheels, not really moving the ball forward and gaining skills that I could kind of take elsewhere. And I happened to live in this town called Greenville, South Carolina, which is a great city. It was home to the headquarters of one of the largest coding boot camps at the time, which was called the Iron Yard. Now, the Iron Yard has since closed, but it started there in Greenville and had expanded nationwide. And I heard of coding boot camps because one of my aunts, the same aunt that had inspired me to study Spanish, mentioned that I might want to check out coding boot camps. She was working in the tech industry and knew about them and thought that could be a good path. So I sat on it for basically a year. So during this whole year where I was kind of doing the social work and really kind of angsty about everything, I started thinking about what is the next step going to be. And of course, I'd heard about boot camps. And so basically in the spring of that year, 
I managed to put everything together in a plan that I felt like made sense, where I put together some summer employment that was going to pay me more and allow me to save a little bit, and then in the fall would start boot camp. And that's basically what ended up happening. So I went through this coding boot camp. It was one of the most stressful times of my life. I had taken a loan to do it and I was completely a fish out of water. I felt like I had to make it work in order to get a job and pay the loan back, but I couldn't rely on any of my former skills, which pretty much all involves reading and writing. And you can kind of BS your way through a lot of that stuff, but there's no BSing with code. It tells you if you're right or you're wrong, and that's pretty much it. And so I basically was just struggling. I felt like I was having a really difficult time. And uh, long story short, ended up making it through. I ended up doing some contract work and then ended up moving here where I am right now in Raleigh, North Carolina. And of course there's been ups and downs since then. I think the trajectory since I decided I wanted to become a software engineer has been up. No doubt the trend overall has been up and to the right. It's been a great decision and I'm really thankful for it. I think a few principles I might draw from my story are, number one, it's never too late. So I never was interested in code. I never fit the stereotype. I was never the kid who took the toaster apart and was tinkering. That's only something that has come later as I've learned that that's a possibility. But you can always start. You can always get going. I don't think it's ever too late. And I don't think these skills are going out of style. And so if you're thinking about getting started, just do it. Uh, teach yourself HTML and CSS over a weekend and try and build yourself a personal website. That's a great place to start. If you're interested at all in technology, there's no better time to get started than now. It's really a principle about learning code and the value of learning code. And I'm stealing this from Ali Abdal, but he basically says that he thinks everyone should learn to code because it teaches you that everything is figure outable. And I couldn't agree more. I think kind of like I was saying that I was never the kid that would take stuff apart to figure out how it works. Since learning to code, I've realized that everything is basically just a system and that if you can kind of break it down into its constituent parts, you can take things apart, you can fix them, you can put them back together. And it's just given me way, way more confidence for learning things that I don't already know because so much of being a software engineer is looking stuff up and having to teach yourself stuff in order to get your work done. Now this meta learning skill is maybe the best part about becoming a software engineer, not even necessarily writing the code itself, but the confidence that it gives you. I think it's really hard. You end up beating your head against the wall a lot. But on the other side of that struggle is this knowledge that you have that you can pretty much figure most things out eventually, given some time, given Google, and you know, given a little bit of effort that you can figure stuff out. And that is just absolutely priceless. So I'm really grateful for that as well. There's a lot of other things I could say. I'm going to cut it a bit short and you'll notice I didn't talk about all the different jobs I've had. I might do a more specific video about my career progression and I also want to do one on salaries so stick around for those. For those of you that are finding these videos I hope you find them helpful. If you're watching this and you're not subscribed consider doing so. Please let me know if you have any questions in the comments and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.